All right, hello everybody. Welcome to our careers event. Um, it looks like everybody who's landed in the, in the lobby pri, uh, pre 10 o'clock has, has made it through. So well, well done to everyone for finding your way in. Um, before I start sharing the slides, I just want to point out a couple of things. Um, as I present the slides, it's going to sort of fill your screen and take away this view that you can see. At the top right of your screen, you may have already noticed it, you have a sort of a different view. You can click between meeting view and map view. <clears throat> so, and and you can flick between them as soon as, um, at any point after I've shared the slides, if you'd like to come back here. But just as a bit of a sound test first, a bit of a, a video test as well, could everybody press Z on your keyboards? Loving the dancing, loving the dancing. Good stuff. It's all coming through loud and clear then. All right, now la last thing, give me it to, to stop this. Give me an F, just tap F a few times. Give us a few, kicks. lovely stuff, thank you. That's loud. <laughs> all right, that, that'll, that is ringing in my ears. Here we go with the slides then, okay. Alrighty, so you should be able to see my screen. So yeah, a big warm welcome to our careers event. Um, I'm Carl and I'm going to be your host for this morning's entertainment. Um, we've been using this platform now since January of this year and we actually use it daily as a virtual office. It's such a brilliant way for us to connect, to work together, to meet and collaborate. Um, but this is the very first time that we've put on an event like this, especially for so many people. So um, you can think of yourselves as pioneers, you know, the first people to attend an event like this. So sort of where were you when the Monster, Mac Monster Academy put on that 2D virtual event? I was in the audience, you can say. Um, so this is one big experiment. Um, and thank you so much for, for, for being part of it. We're not expecting any fire drills. Um, so yeah, please stay seated. Um, here's a little snap of our office space, actually, um, just to sort of tell you a bit more about it. We have things like meeting rooms, we have lunch areas, we even have a little training hub that we use for our inductions. You have all of the kind of natural rooms and experiences that you'd expect from a real office. Um, it makes being remote more human. We even have little desks. So essentially, we work sat at our little virtual desks. And if somebody else comes over to and interrupt it. Things that you just can't do using the sort of traditional tools like Teams and Zoom. Uh, in case you haven't sussed it out yet, you may have walking next to sort of when you become in close proximity to somebody else. But how the platform works is that when you walk up to somebody else, it automatically starts a video and a voice conversation when you're close to them once you've unmuted and put your camera on. Um, but just for now, during the talks, if I could please ask everybody to stay um, muted and keep your videos off. We just want to increase the bandwidth um, that we have available so that everybody in the room can see the people speaking. And at the end, you're going to get to, to sort of use all of the, all of the features. Um, yeah, so we have really endless possibilities with this platform. And we even have a, have a, have a, a go-kart track that you can have a little play with at the end. I think a few people actually sort of navigated their way to that and, and had a little pre, a, a pre-go. So um, we're going to have to duck, duck, um, duck points off of you for, for later when we have a little play. Uh, so yeah, a few housekeeping things, just to tell you a bit more about this space. Um, you can see me, but I can't see you. When you turn your cameras and, um, and, and um, microphones on, you'll be able to see people um, in your row, because that's like a, a sort of space in its own right. Since you're already in the audience listening to this, you should all be already be familiar with moving yourself about with the, with the arrow keys, and you can, if you're a left-handed person, you can you can use W A S and D to move around. Um, I've already mentioned this little bit at the top right, so where you can change your views. Um, here you can mute and unmute your video. Very importantly, please don't click the little sort of computer screen button at the bottom because that will share your screen. So we'll see whatever you're looking at. Um, I know now that I've mentioned it, you're all going to be staring at it thinking, I'd really like to press that button. But if you could refrain, I would, uh, I would really appreciate it. Um, 
A few other little things. When you're walking around the space, if you press X on objects, it'll come up and say you can press X on this object. You can interact with things. So we have booths. Um, we have a booth area. And we have some Easter eggs hidden around that you can all go looking for after the talks. If you get stuck behind somebody, you can press G, hold G, and you can move through them. You can kind of ghost through them so you don't get stuck. And we just had a play with the confetti and, and the, the dancing as well. Um, yeah, I think that's everything on that one. So final few housekeeping slides. Um, if you have questions, feel free to up to the, the, the chat uh, box. Just select everybody stick them in um, and we will come back to those at the end. You're going to have a, a, a chance to ask questions live as well. If you look up, you might not be able to see it now because if you're if you're in the presentation view, I'll point it out later again. But if you look at the top left of the space, there's a little podium. Um, so we'll invite you to come and ask a question live if you'd like to. You can come and stand there and then you will then be able to be seen by everybody uh, in the room. So you can ask your question live and we can just we can just have a have a chat like that. If you have any technical sort of issues for any reason, if you can't see any of the slides, we uh, I think we've sent out who to email uh, in, in your welcome packs. Or if you see somebody who is dressed up in a little little blue outfit, um, they should be labeled as Monster Academy staff. Go and go and find them. And yeah, just enjoy exploring the space after the sessions. No need to stick around after the talks if you wouldn't like to, but we're going to have a, have, a, have a few sessions for anyone who would who would like to um, be part of those. So onto the agenda, we have five sessions. For the first four, all you've got to do is sit back and chill. First up, I'm going to finish off this little introduction, tell you a little bit about me and my journey into medical writing, and then I'll introduce you to Caroline um, for the second session. Um, for the, for the second part of the introduction, sorry. So Caroline's going to introduce herself, um, and she's got a few questions for you via Slido. If you'd like to participate in the interactive um, sort of slide questions, you just need to have your phone at the ready and you just need to scan a QR code and then you'll be able to enter and, and, and um, answer the questions as they come up. And she's going to introduce the topic that we're all here for, medical writing, with some definitions and um, yeah, a few bits and bobs. Caroline is then going to pass over to Laura, who is going to be leading um, our, our panel. We have five panelists who will all be telling you about their own journeys into medical writing. And we've got five brilliant panelists with really different experiences. So hopefully there's something for everybody um, in that. Um, at that point, we would absolutely welcome your comments, comments and questions. And if, if we have a chance to weave them into the, to the chats, we absolutely will do. Laura's then going to pass back to Caroline, who will then be talking about breaking into the industry specifically. And then we're opening the floor up to you lot. So yeah, you can ask us questions live while we're still on, still on stage. Lastly, we're going to um, have a breakout session. So after you're done asking us questions on stage, people on stage and a few of our other writers from Word Monster are going to go and sit um, on these benches and you can come along and have a chat with us individual people. You can chat to more than one of us. Um, come, come on as groups. You don't need to come on one at a time. There's enough space on a bench for five people plus, 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 plus our, our, our writer. So just bundle them, have a chat, and ask whatever you'd like. Um, yeah, once you're all questioned out, then we'll dive next door. You can explore the space, visit the booth area, find those Easter eggs, and have a go around the go-kart track. So the first part of my talk, I would like to wish you a very happy Medcoms Day. This is a day that a chap called Peter Llewellyn started quite a few years back now. Um, one of Peter's Medcoms networking events was, was, in, was in fact how I made my own way into Medcoms. So if you are in the audience, Peter, I, I, I think you said you'd said that you, you potentially were coming along. Please take a bow. Give us a few confetti bombs to show people where you are later on. Um, and yeah, if anyone would like to take pictures of the event, um, and pop them onto socials. You can use the hashtag Medcoms, um, which is one that is 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 sort of going going wild today. And it, feel free to give us some hashtag love as well with hashtag Monster Academy and Write with Bite. So, why are you here today? Is it because you'd like to learn more about medical writing? You'd want to get insights into how to make it as a medical writer. You want to connect with people, or you just want to have some fun. Or maybe you're just interested in seeing how this virtual event is going to pan out, all of which are solid reasons for coming along today. And you should be leaving with some answers to those uh, to those points. 
But let me tell you a little bit more about why we are here today putting this event on for everybody. Now that there's a huge demand for medical writers. There has been for years, but there's not enough medical writers to go around, not enough people who are senior and experienced. But it's really strange because there are loads of people who want to become medical writers, but there just aren't enough entry level jobs out there. And we are seeking to change this through the upskilling of individuals and giving them tangible agency experience and coupling that with working with companies themselves to provide them the support that they need to be able to find, hire, train and mentor junior writers. It's an industry wide problem that agencies just don't have enough time and resources to give new juniors the training that they need and quite frankly deserve because they're focused on their own clients and delivering projects. So we're working with them now to help multiple, multiple um, agencies. So we're essentially bridging the gap between people trying to get into the industry and companies bringing people in at the junior level. Ultimately, we want to raise awareness of the industry and raise the medical writing talent bar and fill this medical writing void that exists. So a little bit about me, I'm actually going to step back a little bit further than 2009 when I started my PhD, just to give you a little bit of a background story briefly. Um, back to the school times, in fact, I didn't like school. In year 10, the very first year of my GCSEs, I actually only attended school for just over half of the year. I think it was 53%. So come the year, come the start of year 11, I was way behind my peers, but I was always sporty. And I think by sort of some stroke of luck in year 11, I developed a really burning interest in human biology and this interest in anatomy, physiology and, and how the body adapted to exercise drew me back into learning across all of my subjects just in time to recover my GCSEs. And this newfound hunger of learning about the body continued into my A-levels and it sent me off to university to study sports science. And the fascination in, in, in health continued um, I really love the exercise physiology, the health, the well-being and the disease. And then after my bachelor's, I actually traveled up from Portsmouth to Aberdeen to study a one year master's in molecular physiology. Absolutely smashed it because I was so motivated. It was brilliant. And I actually got offered a PhD in a really well funded lab with a brilliant supervisor studying a drug target for type 2 diabetes. I loved my PhD often. I hated it sometimes. I got through it in the end, and I'm sure a few people in the audience who have been through PhD programs will share a similar, a similar sort of story. Um, but despite loving the lab and all of the experiments, I think I knew quite early on that I didn't want to stay in academia. And what's going to be interesting for you later is that we have different people at different career, career stages moving across. Um, so yeah, at that time, I started looking, looking into what else I might do. And I stumbled across a website called Medcoms Networking watch some videos and what I saw was a job that contained everything I absolutely loved from my PhD without any of the bad bits. So I started applying, but getting into a role, it, it, it's not easy. My PhD was in fact four years long and I started applying for roles shortly after I entered the third year. So well in advance of finishing my PhD because I wanted to gain experience for the process. I had a couple of interviews. I didn't get them. I wasn't really aiming to get them at that point because I hadn't finished. But then when I was ready and I had that experience, I ended up applying to around 12 roles, I think, maybe if maybe even a few more that I like the look of. I ended up doing seven or eight writing tests. If you're unfamiliar with writing tests, they're a huge part of the application process. Um, I think I was invited to about four interviews in total. I ended up getting two job offers. One was in Reading in the UK, one in Oxford in the UK, and I took the one in Reading because the team seemed more awesome. And uh, I was right, they, they, were, they were brilliant. The key point here is that it's a numbers game getting into medical writing at the junior level. You do have to put your hat in a few rings and without any real guidance, it was probably a lot harder than it could have been if I'd known how to approach things. My first role that I did, was incredible. It was really fantastic. I had a brilliant line manager. Shout out to Annette Keith, absolutely fantastic woman, such a good trainer. And um, she's, she, she still works in medcoms to this day. And um, I, I owe a lot to Annette and her sort of belief in me and the training that she, that 
that she gave in the early days and a lot of her sort of students if you like would certainly certainly say the same and the amount of knowledge that i consumed within this first three months as a medical writer was almost comparable to like my entire phd and it cracked my creative brain wide open which was odd because i never thought of myself as creative until i became a medical writer and i think a lot of scientists have this same sort of battle with am i creative i don't know but often you know once you once you once you get in you, you find out that actually you are but i dislike the traveling in this role it required flying and i wanted to explore the creative copywriting side i love that too a little bit more than the med ed work and i continued in agency roles for a time but i found, found myself getting frustrated with being in an open office it was my own personality my own sort of introverted personality i liked being in my own environment when i was in the office i would like to be sort of have my, have my music on so i can focus on my writing and the traveling around was a nightmare this is all of course you know pre pre-covid times and i thought that i'd take a risk and create something of my own so i set out to create a way of working that worked for me and other people like me a remote working way a flexible way of working and this company has now been built into a team of around 26 permanent people with loads of other people who support us externally with finance hr it and all of the things that go with running an agency and a whole bunch of freelance medical writers as well so our entire team probably stands well over 40 to 50 souls now so shout out to all the monsters you're all absolutely fantastic and really make um really make my my sort of working life such a pleasure um so now, so coming to more recent times over the past 20 months or so our entire team led by caroline who i'll introduce you to in a moment has worked incredibly hard to bring our combined knowledge of this team together to build our monster academy program and just this year we've renewed our mission we're now looking to transform healthcare communication support worldwide building a brighter future for those that work in the world that we call hashtag medcoms. At WordMonster, we do a bunch of stuff. We started with medical writing, but we've since expanded our offerings. Medical writing is still very much at the heart of what we do, working across the kind of creative promotional areas, the med affairs, med ed, and the technical publications. But now we have creative strategy, a dedicated SEO service that we're just launching. And um, we now do virtual and in-person events in spaces like these. Um, and of course, training through our Monster Academy program. Our team are incredible. We've accumulated a few degrees along the way um, when, when, when you top them up, but not everybody has a PhD, which is perhaps an interesting talk, talking point for later in the show, if anybody has particular questions around that. Um, th this photo here was taken at um, our uh, annual get together last year, uh, an event that we call our Monster Mash. Um, so there you go, that, that's all from me for now. I'll pass over to Caroline and I'll see you a bit later. Thank you. Hi everyone. First, I'd like to say, yeah, how excited I am to be here and see so many uh, 2D virtual faces in the audience. Um, so welcome, and yeah, thank you for taking the time to come here this morning. Um, I'm first going to introduce myself, and then I'm going to go into a bit of background about what is medical writing and what is medcoms. So I am Caroline, and yeah, thank you for the introduction, Carl. I am a principal medical writer here at WordMonster. As well as having a passion for medical writing and communicating complex scientific topics, I love all things education. And now I'm in the very privileged position of being involved in training the next generation of uh, medical writers, being the head of the Monster Academy here at WordMonster. So at WordMonster HQ, we all have our code names or monster names. I'm going to start off by letting you know about my monster name. My monster name is Geneva. Um, we all pick these names when we start off at WordMonster. And at WordMonster, we have quite um, a culture on life first and the family life balance. And I actually picked the name Geneva because we'd just been on a family holiday to Geneva before I started at WordMonster. Family is very important to me. I have two, two little girls. Um, so yeah, I wanted to bring that in. Also, I wanted to bring in my love of science 
and genetics was my first passion. So clearly that falls into it as well. And I love the name Geneva. So there is my monster name, genetics and also family life. I have, as I said, I, I have a passion for education. And so my skill set, as well as sharing um, the love of science, is working in med ed, which we'll come to talk about a little bit later is one of the, the main topics, main areas of medical writing you can get involved in. And I'm exper an experienced educator, as we'll see on the next slide with, with um, my background, how I got to where we are today. And my passion, other than um, for sitting in the spa and the sauna on the weekend, my passion will be seeing others succeed and being part of their journey, which, as I say, is wonderful being in, in the role that I am now and leading up the Monster Academy. So here is my path to um, word monster. Um, as you can see through my roadmap, I've taken quite a windy journey to get to where I am today. And like Carl, my, my passion started at school as well. I remember being in middle school and I first realised that I left biology and that was going to be my life. Um, and yeah, it took me to, to here. I think, um, yeah, I have quite a, 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 a windy path, but I think that's really good. I think it brings so many more skills and values and rapid repertoire to, to being a medical writer. And I think if any of you in the audience today are thinking of having a career change, you might be in a similar position. I began with a master's degree at Bath University, where I also completed a, a placement year in the drug discovery um, and pharmacology department at a pharma company based in Reading. And then I went on to complete a PhD in medical genetics at Birmingham University. I began my postdoc position in a protein diagnostic company, running retrospective clinical trials and managing a small research group. At this point, it's best we don't mention Western blots. They became the bane of my life. But I did get to travel to lots of international conferences and set my work, so this made up for it. But this was the time I realised, probably due to the Western blots, that I wanted to try my hand at something non-lab based, but still related to medical research and medicine. So I transitioned into a role as an education development officer at the NHS National Genetics Education Centre. And this was my first experience of medical writing. Um, we wrote for healthcare professionals and patients. We produced slide decks, training, leaf pieces, videos, animations, um, all, all around the use of genetics and genetic testing in the NHS. Um, as well as having children, I then went on to lecture um, uh, biological, biomedical sciences at Worcester University. And this led me to um, going to secondary school, science teaching, and gain a postgraduate diploma in education. Nearly there, I told you it was, it was a long journey. Uh, my last stop on my roadmap is um, working um, again in a protein diagnostic company as an MSL. An MSL is a medical science liaison, it's somebody in pharma who goes and um, explains complex information to clinicians and, and key opinion leaders in, in the field. So I had a dual role as an MSL and as a medical writer in the um, SciComs department. And this gave me the most valuable experience that, that, I, that I had as, as a medical writer. Not only there did I um, have a role where I produced and wrote um, slide decks and manuscripts and marketing pieces, but, but also having an experience as an MSL was really valuable. And this is where my journey at Word Monster began. Here at Word Monster, I have worked for many clients um, and direct clients in other agencies and worked on promotional work to medcoms to med ed. Um, and yeah, we cover it all. So I started here just before the pandemic when um, working from home was soon to become the norm for um, yeah, the entire world. And yeah, I've now um, transitioned to become head of the Monster Academy here. So enough about me. I know you're all really here to find out about careers in medical writing and medcoms. And I'm sure you've all done your research, which has led you to this event. But I'm going to take the next few minutes to explain a little bit more about careers in medical writing and medcoms. So maybe you are all sit there, sitting there thinking that medical writing is a fairly new career perhaps supporting pharma and portraying the use of modern medicine? Well, think again. The first record of a medical writer actually dates back to the ancient past, 
the mythical god Thor, a god who worshipped in Egypt between 6,000 and 30 BC, documented the use of medicine, the body and diseases on Papraeus scrolls. In fact, medical writing can be followed throughout history, from the Hippocrates of, of Kos to the great Roman scholar Galen to the 17th century when medical um, terms were first translated from Latin into modern languages. Uh, in 1812, you can see here is when the New England Journal of Medicine was founded. The New England Journal of Medicine and Surgery is the oldest continuous medical periodical, which is central to the rigorous peer review process that holds high levels of scientific accuracy and stringent edit editing processes to, me to medical publications. And here we are on the right hand side today, a gather town everyone gathered in 2023. So if you are considering a career in medical writing, you're actually following the footsteps of some pretty mighty medical writing giants. So what is medical writing? Medical writers convey information in a concise, unambiguous style approach to the target audience. That is the main definition I like to use when, when we um, go through this in the Monster Academy. So you can think that the role of a medical writer is to use science and language to deliver information successfully while working to the highest ethical standards and adhering to industry regulations and guidelines. So if you're thinking of becoming a med medical writer and you're thinking, yeah, this is for me, what kind of skills do you think we should have as a medical writer? So I've broken this down into four different categories. Firstly, the key attributes, and I think attention to detail would be one that all medical writers would say is key up there. And I remember as starting at Word Monster, the first social trip I went on was over to Dublin and we all sat in a restaurant and realised we were all starting to look for typos in, in the menu that we were looking at and we didn't even mean to. And it's that kind of attention to detail that you, you may realise that you, you have, which is super important if you're going to be a medical writer. And that together with communication skills and a good work ethic are really important. And then of course, being a medical writer, it's combining that love for science and medicine with your love of English and language. So having a scientific and a medical background is really key and really important to have the understanding of medicine of biomedical concepts and terminology when you get going in medical writing you'll soon become familiar with different guidelines and different documents um, which will also be key but yeah having that ability to use pubmed and do a literature search and understand the the, the literature you're reading is, and have that critical um, thinking ability is really important and then as i say language the writers so so having a great um, writing skills is going to be really important. You need to be able to write clearly and accurately with grammar which is spot on. So you need to be able to present information clearly but also compellingly so you really get that story across to your audience. And then finally transferable skills as I as you saw my journey here has been quite long and I think everyone accumulates those transferable skills as you go through life which are really important teamwork leadership project management resilience all these transferable skills are also really important so I, I must say I love this slide actually I, the, the picture on here, here is great and quite an apple clock end of the world scheme here so can you imagine life with no medical writers it might not be quite as dramatic as you can see in in this um picture here but it might not also be quite the blissful summer's day spent on a beach sipping ice cold mojitas maybe life would end would there be mayhem chaos destruction what do you think would happen if we had no medical writers carl said earlier we have slido so just for a bit of fun we're going to have um, a little brainstorm to see what life would be like without medical writers. So all you need to do is grab your phone and scan in the QR code you can see on the screen here. And hopefully then you can start typing away. So be as creative as you can. What would you think life would be like without medical writers? 
unregulated, a great start there. Wow, we have got so much coming up here. Fantastic. So we've got fake news, sad, chaos, confusing, poor healthcare, disease, dissemination of the wrong medical information. I like that. Filled with typos and typos in that as well. Fantastic. Dangerous, a lack of knowledge, all over the place, full of confusion, less patient, patient consideration. GPT, <laughs> very relevant there. Less robust science. Poor written publications in the New England Journal of Medicine. Potential harm, harm to patients, really important there. Uneducated. Less robust science. Mistrust in healthcare, which, yeah, I think is really important, especially with. The so social media these days. I can see a few people are, are still typing, so, so I'll leave that there, there for now. So thank you, that, that was really great. And I think you can see from this just how important medical writers are and what an important role it is to be, to be a medical writer. So life might not be the scene from that disaster movie, but pharma companies may struggle to get their drugs to market or to market them as effectively as, as they can. It may be that adverse events might not be recorded um, accurately or, or in a time, timely way. So there may be an increased risk to patients, to healthcare professionals, which I think a few people have written down here. Doctors might not get the training they need. So maybe they don't have the latest information, the latest knowledge about um, the current medicines that, that are available for, the, for their patients, ultimately leading to um, yeah, less, less choice of treatment for patients and patients themselves, they, they may not have the information to enable them to make informed choices, again, affecting health related quality of life for patients. So yeah, I think we're all on the same wavelength here that um, medical writing is not only a really fun and fantastic area to work in, but it's also really, really important as well. And Armageddon, let's finish with that Armageddon, Armageddon um, entry there. Absolutely. That's what, definitely what I think life would be like without medical writers. Thank you very much for filling that in, everybody. So just to give you a few examples of the things that we, we work on as medical writers, there are a vast variety of documents that medical writers can work on. And these are just some examples. Um, starting at the top, um, we create slide decks, so power, PowerPoint slide decks. And these are often for educational and training materials. It's likely your GP at some point will have um, received training through um, a training resource generated by um, a medical writer. And we often work closely with pharma to generate um, training decks about the latest um, drugs which they have got to bring into market. Regulatory documents are really important. These are documents written which are required by regulatory agencies to support the approval of the latest drugs or medical um, devices. Um, scientific publications, these are the preparing manuscript for submission at journal, a scientific journal, and this is vital, this is how we know um, and how we have that advancement of medical knowledge. Um, to, to help it, it increase um, the medicines we have available. We are often involved in research and operation and writing those kind of materials for pharma. So these are kind of materials that assist, assist pharma companies' research and operations, which are required to enable drugs to enter and remain on the market, including materials for new drugs and health service launches. We are often involved in supporting at congresses, as well as um, as well as in um, in our role in supporting congresses, we often produce conference posters and slide decks as well, which are going to be presented at congress. Promotional materials is a large thing. We are often involved in generating promotional materials for pharma companies, and also lay materials. So increasingly, there's more of an involvement in patients. Um, in the journey to of, of, a, of a drug's life cycle 
and we are now involved in helping create those those that information for patients so often we've created things like lay summaries of clinical trials which are really important to make sure that either people who are involved in clinical trials know all of the information that came out of the, those studies so that's just a little little taster of the kind of work we get involved in in medical writing but it is so varied there's such a wide um, area of, of things you can get involved in it's really fantastic talking about a lot about medical writing boys medcoms we often hear that term medcoms so medcoms agencies are contracted by pharma companies to provide specialist support in communicating data agencies require people with a range of skills and personalities and not just medical writers but also the account managers and um, project managers there's a whole team of different people who all come into this family at a medical comms agency so medcoms agencies play an integral role in the pharma company's efforts to launch and sell those medicines through all of those different documents we have produced as we see it saw on the previous slide and we always think about our audience when we write documents knowing your audience is really key to make sure you're writing to that audience and to the, to the, le the level that they're going to understand so what audiences do we generally write for a lot of the time we're writing for healthcare professionals, so doctors, nurses, pharmacists. We might be writing materials aimed at pharma employees and also patients and healthcare givers. So before we move on to our, our Q&A um, session, where we can look at some writers here at Word Monster and look at how they got into medical writing, it would be nice to know a bit about you. There's so many of us here today in the audience. It would, yeah, it would be great to know a little bit more about you. So we've got some slide day questions coming up. They're just multiple choice, super um, simple. If you keep the app open on, on your phone, the page that you were on, they'll come up automatically, or you can just scan in the QR code as it comes up. So firstly, where are you joining us from today? If you scan in that code, in fact, I think I lied. I think this is another cloud, word cloud. There we go, Liverpool, London, Aberdeen, Portugal, Sydney, wow, Australia. Geneva, fantastic to have somebody here from Geneva. New Yorker. Wow, we are reaching a long way. This is fantastic. This is what I love about virtual events is you can just really reach out to everybody no matter where they are. Somebody's in their kitchen, I like that. Birmingham, the place of my heart, fantastic. India, Manchester, oh, it's amazing. Germany, South Africa, Chester. Feels like we have a lot from London. Amazing. Well, that is just fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing that. One more person type, and so I'll just let them finish so we can get a really good idea of where everyone is from. Cyprus. I think you're just trying to make us jealous now. You're in Cyprus, although we have got good weather here today. Fantastic. Thank you, everyone. And next question. Um, it might be that this is, um, you're not quite there yet to know, but if you do know what area of medical writing are you interested in? Is it medcoms, medical education, medical advertising, scientific publications, writing for patients in the public, all of the above, or regulatory writing? as well not sure why that's gone to the bottom there or looks like we're in a tie between medcoms and writing for patients in the public Fantastic. Well, that is really great to know, and you're absolutely in the right place. So fantastic. And yeah, please do come and reach out to us at the end of the talks, and we can answer any of the specific questions you have as well. Thank you so much for that. Next question. We've got just two questions left. What is your highest level of education?
brilliant. Well, I think we have got a very highly educated meeting going on here right now. Fantastic. Loads of um, yeah, people with PhDs, there, BSCs and MSCs. Fantastic. And on to one other question, which is, we, yeah, we've been talking about a, lot, a lot about our 2D office. So just, yeah, what is your preferred place to work, hybrid, remote or office based? Brilliant. It looks like we have a lot of like-minded people here who don't like sitting in traffic jams. So that's fantastic. Thank you so much for, yeah, for taking part in, in that quick survey. That's really interesting. So I'm going to hand over now to my colleague, Laura, who is going to, who is going to run the panel session with our medical writers here at Word Monster. Hello, thank you so, so much, Carl and Caroline, for that brilliant introduction uh, and for dropping those big pearls of wisdom. And it's really cool to see where everyone is, is coming from today. Um, so, as Caroline said, my name is Laura. Bear with me a moment while I just share my screen. Um, okay, there we go. So, um, yes, as I said, I am Laura. I'm a principal medical writer, just like Caroline at Word Monster. And I'm joined today by our brilliant panel. So we've got Rebecca, Megan, Emma and Hannah here today. So we'll all be kind of sharing a few of our stories to hopefully, you know, in, inspire and um, and kind of just open up those really essential discussions of how we go about how, how we got started in industry and uh, and how it can be done. I do love putting words together um, it might sound like it's a simple thing but it actually can be quite challenging because well, anyone can put words on a page but it's putting them in a way that kind of is accessible and resonates is clear it's compelling you know it's a whole other it's a whole important skill set that's essential in medical communications I also think that empathy and humor can go a lot especially when you're supporting your clients so a bit about my journey then. So uh, like many of you, I started out in academia. So I did a master's in research at Cardiff University and then following that, um, did my PhD in immunology. And uh, while I, I realized while I was there that I enjoyed writing about my experiments way more than running my experiments. Uh, it, was, um, it was a bit of a disaster in the lab. And I discovered Medcoms completely by chance through a careers fair. So up until then, I would kind of been a bit nervous about my future and just thought I was going to be on this uh, like um, treadmill that would kind of maybe not treadmill, you know, um, when you're in the airport and you go on the travel aid, that take you to your, um, your gate? And what would just be heading towards postdocville. But then some when I heard about um, medcoms, I think as Carl said, you know, integrating all the things that I enjoyed um, and discarding things that I didn't enjoy, something kind of clicked and I found myself really excited, wanted to learn more. I applied. To social medical writer role at a health education agency called Virgo Health in July 2013. And I was um, Cardiff born and bred, but uh, at the time there weren't really any agencies based in Cardiff. So I actually relocated to London in Richmond to, to start that job. And since that first role, I like Carl kind of was craving a bit more creativity and, and did a little bit of a foray into medical advertising. So I've worked across a large range of agencies, large and small, kind of working on med educational and promotional materials. So quite a full spectrum of medical writing. And I joined Word Monster in 2020 as I was current at the time commuting about an hour each way to my job in Windsor and haven't really looked back. And uh, having started a career at a time when my remote working was practically unheard of, I think it's really great that new writers today don't have to make those difficult to scale. That's me in a nutshell. Um, what I'm going to do um, now is I'm going to hand over to um, the lovely Rebecca to sort of tell her story. Hi, Laura. Thank you. And hi, everyone. Um, yep, I'm Rebecca. I'm the publications lead here. 
uh, gin lover and uh, charcuterie board lover and um, my mum. Uh, so my skill set is the scientific storytelling, uh, building the client rapport and, and I also really enjoy mentoring uh, new writers. Um, and for me, the scientific storytelling, it's about getting that really complex data and putting it together in such a way that the audience immediately gets the so what. They know right away why this is relevant and why it's important and it really, really speaks to them. And from a publication point of view, it's so important because publishing data is how we create that body of evidence and that body of high quality peer review evidence is what um, what our key opinion leaders and what our stakeholders use to influence decision making in healthcare. And so that is the way that for me, I can be involved in transforming healthcare. And it's something that's obviously so important to us and so important to our mission here at Word Monster. And I love that I get to do that with my job as the publication lead. Um, and as well as that, I just, I have a passion for making sure that that message is accessible for everyone. We're talking about patients, we're talking about carers. We have to make sure that they can be part of the conversation as well. So I'm a big advocate in making sure that we involve patients and carers in as much of the journey as we can. Um, there we go. Sorry about that. <laughs> Um, yes, so uh, very similar. I think most of us started off um, down the traditional academia, uh, BSc honours, MRes and PhD routes. So my background therapy area was neuroscience, which I loved. I loved spinal cord injury research and multiple sclerosis. Uh, but the thing that I loved most was talking about it. I could have talked about it until well, till the day was long. Um, not so great maybe in the lab, didn't enjoy it so much, but really loved putting that passion across to other people and, and seeing that moment where they, you know, it lit up and they understood why that research was relevant. And I think that led me into a little stint as a student lecturer. I loved sort of igniting that same passion in students. Um, and it was kind of there, it was sort of always in the background, but I followed the traditional route, which was to go um, into a postdoc role. And so I carried on there in five years uh, in a different therapy area this time and worked across a number of, of cancer research projects, um, which is, is great and helpful from my medcoms journey because it was a switch of therapy area. And even within my five years in academia, I switched around a little bit more there as well from my original neuroscience roots. Um, but again, there was that feeling that I loved talking about and writing about and communicating the science. I wasn't really loving the day to day experience. And also my personal experience um, as a mum was that I was finding it really hard. I didn't find academia to be the most flexible job option. And I didn't feel like I had job security because you have that continual every two to three years, you're out of contract and it can be very stressful. And so I took a little bit of a, a pause, I suppose, a moment to kind of reflect because I wanted to get it right. I knew that I didn't want to walk away from science completely because I still had that passion and I really loved science. And so it was trying to find something that I could use those skills, um, but still get some of the flexibility and the job security that I needed, I suppose, as a mum. And that's where medical writing came along for me. Um, and so I was lucky to, um, start as a medical writer at Fisherwack and then progress to senior medical writer and scientific project lead. And again, some great experience there, worked with some great people and got some fantastic mentoring. Um, was very lucky to be able to work in some really high profile publications accounts um, and really got to see what life was like there. And then the opportunity came up to actually lead the publication service here at Word Monster, which was really, really exciting for me. And so I joined Word Monster towards the end of last year and I'm the publications lead here. And very recently I've been um, certified as a, a medical publications professional, which is a really, really exciting part of my journey, but also just shows that the learning doesn't stop. You know, even once you're, once you're in, once you're in your job, you can continue to learn and continue to better yourself. And for me, it was a much more structured career path than the traditional academic route where you're a postdoc or a group leader and there's not very much in between. 
and um, yeah, that's my that's my journey. So feel free to ask me any questions, Laura, or audience. Yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so we'll be doing questions at the end, but obviously if you have a specific question for Rebecca, you can flag that in, in our chat. We're going to compile all the questions and also um, you'll get a chance to speak to some of our lovely panel at the end. Uh, but that's been fantastic. I really loved, um, obviously, on, um, on your Monster profile, just talking about it awesome why we are doing this. Medical communications is so vital and it really um, links back to, you know, Caroline, um, talking about a world about medical writers. So we are really lucky to have, um, you know, you, you jo um, join the industry, Rebecca, and, and obviously um, bringing um, you know, robust and accessible and, and all those things. Uh, so obviously, um, so I'm get I think, um, so jump, jumping from postdoc to, um, to medical writing, what would you say was the biggest hurdle you had to overcome to make that transition? Um, from, well, two things. So one thing for me was the physicality of, of at that time, the industry was quite different. And so homeworking didn't really exist. So for me, it was location. Um, I knew I was going to face a big commute. And at the time I had a young baby at home. So that was a big I suppose a deterrent for a little while that I had to really wait until I felt she was old enough and that I was going to be able to leave her to do this commute because my first job uh, was 50 mile each way uh, commute, which takes a, a big part of your day. Um, but even getting my foot in the door, I found really, really difficult. It was like, it felt to me like medical writing was some very exclusive clique that I just couldn't, I couldn't get into, even though I felt like you know, surely I'm valuable, I've been a postdoc, I've got experience, it seemed like none of that mattered, like there was just, there were so many people vying for the same roles. And often there was no feedback given. Um, you know, I would, I would send off letters or make contacts and not really hear back from people. Um, and then I did a couple of writing tests, which Carl sort of briefly touched on. But if anybody hasn't done one before, they can vary from requiring maybe one or two hours of your time right up till uh, some agencies will give you something that can take you an entire week to do. And so one particular experience was uh, I had a four part test that took me the best part of the week and then just didn't get any feedback. It was just no thank you. And that that was tough. It was like knocking on the door constantly and nobody answering and not really sure where to turn next. Yeah, I know that was, um, yeah, that sounds definitely like, um, I think a lot of people here may be um, having a similar challenge now, certainly uh, trying to break into the industry. So how did you overcome this in your case? Um, networking. <laughs> um, I just, I thought, right, okay, I really, this is what I want now. I need to really make this happen. I need to sort of bring it to myself. So I set about revamping my LinkedIn profile and I just got trigger happy with the connect button. Um, anybody who wants to connect with me and do the same, feel free. I will connect back with you, no problem. But build your network because you can watch, you can learn, you can observe. Um, and that's what I did. And I was actually very, very lucky that in a moment of frustration, I put a post out just asking for help, asking for how do I improve on my, you know, my writing skills or my ability to pass a test when I'm not sure what it is that I need to improve on? I don't know where I've gone wrong. And Peter Llewellyn, who, as Carl said, organises uh, the Medcoms event, very kindly shared it with his huge, huge, huge network. And all of a sudden, I was, I was internet famous for five minutes. I was viral and I had everybody reaching out to me and offering to help um, because that's one thing I will say there are a lot of great people in our industry who are only too willing to help because I think many of us have faced similar challenges in getting started and so uh, thank you to Peter for sharing that um, people helped me read my previous test gave me great feedback and from there Someone from Fisherwack actually spotted the post because Peter had shared it, got in touch and, and that was it. That was how I got started. So it's not going to be exactly like that for everyone in the audience, but 
certainly make those connections make sure your linkedin is really really up to date and says a lot about you and what you're interested in and who you are and just get talking and listening to what's going on in the industry Thank you so much. That is, um, yeah, some really brilliant advice. And I can already see in the chat that a few folks have posted uh, their LinkedIn information. So, uh, and so obviously do, do take the chance to connect with other individuals and perhaps even just go up and chat to somebody today. Um, if they're looking like they're a bit lonely on their own, just go and say hello and you never know what may come of it. Uh, I think it's very important for us already in the industry to give others a leg up and to amplify those voices. So. Thank you so much for sharing that story, Rebecca. Um, one other thing, obviously, you you have been in the, the industry for about half a decade now. Um, and I know that since I started 10 years ago, I feel like there's been a lot of changes. What kind of do you think is the biggest change you've you kind of seen in that time? Um, so the, the industry is changing massively in terms of, uh, obviously, I'm the publication lead, so I'm very focused on publication. but. We have a huge focus now. We have it's almost like the industry's woken up and realised patients. We we need to be involving our patients more in this process. We need to be making things much more accessible, and we need to understand now that the traditional way that people used to learn is not not necessarily for our very very busy um, healthcare practitioners who don't have the time to read an entire journal. They just need sort of snippets of information. So we're becoming much more digital, which is great. Um, but from a personal perspective and from, you know, a job perspective, for me, as I say, there was no option of home working when I started, um, certainly not at entry level. It was very much frowned upon to ask to work from home for most agencies um, if you were a new starter in medcoms. A lot of that changed because of COVID, because people had to stay home. Um, but the other side of things was flexible working and part time working were also very, very rare. Um, I was very fortunate that Fisherwick were a bit more open minded to that. And so I was lucky to start in a flexible part time role uh, when I started with them. But that was very, very, very unheard of. And I got a lot of um, funny looks and, you know, just flat out refusals from other agencies when it was, you know, brought as part of the conversation because it was almost like the expectation was, no, you have to earn that right. You have to earn the right to work part time and you have to earn the right for flexible working and you don't have that right as an entry level writer. And now I think that that's changed. I think we're recognising the value of our associate writers and our medical writers. And it's not such um, this feeling that you've got to earn those basic privileges to have flexibility in your working life and of course that's something we heavily embody here at uh, Word Monster which is is great and it's lovely to see that change and be part of it now. Yeah that is a really good point I had a very similar experience with my first agency um, having um, a one-off um, work from home request um, denied um, I was um, asked by my landlord to um, if I could stay home and keep an eye on his dog who'd just been discharged from the vet and I was just told no because we don't trust you not to to play with a dog all day <laughs> so I completely understand that and I think trust is a key thing that um, you know I think uh, it, it shows if um, companies are able to offer like flexible even hybrid work and I think it shows that they respect they have a respect for how people like to work their own personal work and style and you know, ultimately helping get the best from their employees. Um, but thank you so, so much for sharing your story, Rebecca. Um, we'll just move on now to our next writer. So Megan is um, is, a, is a new, um, also a new medical writer at Wordmonster. And she joined, uh, she joined us about six, seven months ago and has been um, absolutely making great strides. So I'll pass over to Megan now. Thank you, Laura. And thank you for having me as part of the panel today. Um, so I'm Megan. I'm a cell biologist turned engineer and now a medical writer. Um, of course, I love writing, but I also love the design side that comes along with medcoms. And I've been recently finessing my client charming skills as well. And my passion is to make an impact, um, a positive impact through my work in whichever way that may be. Thank you. Um, so I guess my path to medical writing started on my like 10 year journey through university. So I started off at Liverpool John Moores University where I did my bachelor's in biomedical science. I then stayed to do a master's in industrial biotechnology. I also had a brief stint in the biologics industry before moving to Leeds to do um, 
another master's because I'm a glutton for punishment and a PhD. And that was a part of a CDT um, for tissue engineering and regenerative medicine. And during that time, I also got to do a clinical secondment at the Leeds Teaching Hospitals, which allowed me to interact with patients. After passing my transfer viva, I went through a pretty strange period of time in my life. I was on maternity leave, the COVID pandemic had hit, and I decided that after finishing my PhD, I didn't want to stay in academia anymore. And through the power of TikTok, I came across Word Monster and Medcoms. And before I joined Word Monster, I managed to get some freelance experience um, through the Aspirations Freelance Scheme at Aspire Scientific. I also did some freelance referencing work for Word Monster whilst I finished my lab work. And then when I finished my lab work from PhD, last year in September, I joined Word Monster full time as an associate medical writer and was recently promoted in May this year. Yay. Yeah, um, yeah, thank you so much for sharing your story. And I really, um, what's, um, you know, you've worked across, you know, education industry and the clinical setting. Uh, I am. Um, so what um, what was it that kind of um, drew you to deciding to um, to move to transition over to medical communications? So for me, I feel that answer has a personal and professional reasons behind it. So as I said before, being on maternity leave during the COVID pandemic, it was quite a lonely time. And because we lived in Leeds away from our family, we usually traveled to see them and we couldn't do that anymore. So we decided that once I finished my PhD, we wanted to move closer to home. The one caveat to that was I didn't want to lose my career and risk all the hard work I'd already done to move back to a town and not be in the city anymore. Um, I was always complimented on my writing throughout my university journey and throughout my PhD. Um, and it's something that I enjoyed. I'd grown tired of the lab. And actually, I liked being in my own little bubble out of the lab, just me and my laptop typing away. So that prompted me to search for alternatives, which ultimately led me to Medcoms and now Word Monster. Wonderful. Yeah. And uh, so um, in your short time at Word Monster, you know, um, for those who don't know, Megan, you've worked at uh, you've actually had the chance to um, work on a diverse range of project, um, projects and even work in uh, like on site as well, which has been, uh, I know, quite a, quite an interesting challenge for you. Um, also, uh, one thing to mention is that I know you when you joined Word Monster, you took part in our Monster Academy fundamentals course as part of your induction, uh, So, which we'll be talking more, more about later. So what did you find like, valuable about that course and how do you feel like it, it's shaped your career? So Monster Academy, I was really lucky to be enrolled on as part of my training. It was right at the start when I joined as well. So it's perfect timing. And for me, it gave me that experience of trying my hand at different briefs across different therapy areas very early on in my career. So I felt very comfortable with whatever a client would give me as I moved through. It also helped me kind of address any misconceptions I had of medcoms. Coming from academia, I was solely focused on publications, congress materials, posters, slides. I didn't really realise how vast Medcoms was until I started Monster Academy. So for that reason, that was really helpful. And it's definitely helped me have confidence when addressing any client brief that might come my way. I also quickly realised why I joined as an associate. I think sometimes joining as an entry level you feel like you're not a great writer and it's not that at all. It's just finessing your current writing skills and how you can apply that to different briefs so you can tackle whatever a client may throw at you. Yes, I love that. And absolutely, I think that is a challenge that I think we'll be discussing later because I know that a lot of you may already be in established careers and it may feel a little bit jarring or disheartening to be starting an entry level. But uh, absolutely, I think that because we are such a specialised industry, you know, and very regulated there is a learning curve there so I think that these new, tra new training opportunities for, for new writers really help set you on the right path there. Uh, thank you so much Megan for sharing your story and as, I, as always if there are any questions for um, Megan based on what Megan said you know you can pop them in the chat and we can try to get to them towards the end. Uh, so in the interest of time I'm just going to jump now into um, our third panellist who is Emma. Hi, thanks, Laura, and it's great to be here to talk to everyone today. Um, yep, so like Laura said, I'm Emma, and some of my favourite things, which is perfect for medcoms, is that I love science, words, and a lot, 
lot of coffee. Um, and for me, it's all about lyrical writing. It's about just creating a story that sings like a song. You know, you want people to kind of nearly chant back to you what you've written um, because it's just so memorable for them. And uh, for me, it's all about telling a science story with a lot of heart and that's how people will remember. And so um, my story, if you haven't picked from my accent, um, I started back in Australia. So I'm from Sydney and I completed an undergraduate degree in biotechnology uh, with first class honours research. And that's what hooked me on research. And I was a sucker and I moved straight into a PhD in molecular microbiology where I studied a little bug, uh, Helicobacter pylori, uh, for those playing at home. And it, this is what thrives in a harsh environment in our stomach. And I was trying to figure out how it was doing that. And so I really enjoyed kind of understanding the, the little nitty and gritty of, of that, little, um, that little bug. But throughout my PhD, I really fell in love with science communication when I taught both undergraduate and master students across a range of different subjects. And I was a science ambassador for my university. Uh, for the better part of about 10 years and I spent all of my spare time promoting and teaching science to everyone. Um, I was very passionate about trying to transition young girls into science, showing them that they can do whatever they want, um, but also high school students across the spectrum um, throughout all of Sydney. And so basically I was shouting from the rooftops to anyone who would listen just how amazing science can be and how you can really change the world um, when you move into science. Um, and so after I graduated from my PhD, I packed my bags and I moved to the south of France, um, Toulouse to be exact. And not only did I drink a lot of wine and eat a lot of delicious cheese, but I followed my true passion, which was science communication. I knew the lab wasn't for me. I did enjoy my experiments and I, but the best part for me was writing about it and talking about it. Um, and so I knew I had to follow that. Um, it was a big leap of faith to kind of back myself from the get go um, and, yeah, it was, it was very daunting, but I, I don't regret a second of it. And so I got a job as an in-house science writer at a biotech company. Um, and I had many hats in this job um, from writing uh, product uh, descriptions and web pages, creating animations throughout the, the pandemic to try to educate um, as many people as I possibly could about, about COVID. Um, but while doing this job, the one thing that I became truly fascinated with was writing for the web. And out sprung my passion for ensuring that we write not only awesome science content or medical content, but we ensure that it is found and make sure that anyone in the world, whoever needs the content can find it and understand it and use it um, to ensure that they're living their best life. And so after three and a half years in France, I packed my bags again and I headed to the UK, which is where I am now. And I started at WordMonster about two years ago now, just shy of two years. And uh, like Megan, I started as an associate writer here. Um, and I could not agree more with the fact that, um, you know, it was a bit hard for me to move from something that was quite established as a writer to, to an entry level position. But I totally understand that starting it as an associate writer meant that I learned all the skills I possibly needed um, to move into the medcom space. And um, I've moved through the ranks now through WordMonster, which has been a true blessing. And I've gone through medical writer and now I'm a senior medical writer and the lead of our search and digital team, where I really get to pursue the passion of making sure that what we write is found and used all over the world. Thank you, Emma. No, it definitely sounds like you've come full circle there. You've able, been able to combine your, your passion for communicating science, you know, as your, your role as a science ambassador, for instance, and then later on, you know, within the digital sphere, making sure that uh, those, um, you know that information is is widely accessible to those who need it and not you know uh, languishing somewhere on a website where it can't be found i think that it is it is so crucial and i think that is why this is a um it was so important for us as word monster to la launch this service and for you to have to be at the forefront of that uh so yeah thank you for that um brilliant uh yeah, the, the brilliant overview. Uh, so I think a few people, particularly people who maybe don't know a lot about medical communications, they may be confused by what exactly a medical writer is versus maybe a healthcare writer or a science writer, so which is your background. Uh, so um, uh, I was interested to, to know about, more about your transition from science writing to medical writing. Yeah, sure. It's, absolutely. It's a question that I didn't really know the answer of two, two years ago, really, to be honest with you. Um, and science writing and medical writing are 
quite different. Um, like you alluded to earlier, actually medical writing has a lot more regulations, boundaries, um, and I guess a framework that the writing sits within, um, and rightly so. Patients and healthcare professionals are using these materials to, to make their decisions about, about their health. And so it absolutely um, needs to have these boundaries. Um, and I also found there was a lot more client communication, obviously, um, that I wasn't necessarily used to um, working in-house. Um, and so there were a lot more calls, emails, smoke signals, you know, carrier pigeons, and just a totally different day-to-day -day routine. Um, and also, science writing for me, from my experience, was starting at a different stage with the product development pipeline. Um, as a science writer, I was really focusing on the R&D stages of the product development. So, you know, chatting with the R&D um, dudes and dudettes about, you know, what they're doing, how their experiments are going, how can we move this to the clinic, you know, that very initial, like, uh, discovery phase. Um, whereas a lot of the medical writing um, that I've experienced has been more about moving it from that that discovery phase now we're in the trials and we're in the clinic and really getting the information out there to a different audience and communicate it in a different way but that all said um, there are many different parallels and overlaps which has been um, I think is super important to remember that when you move from one job to another despite them being potentially vastly different which um, uh, my colleague Hannah will talk about um, there are definitely um, transferable skills and so as a science writer I was reading and writing about fundamental science across therapy areas, um, oncology, immunology, infectious diseases, you name it. And this foundational knowledge really helps me daily because I have a really good grasp to you know, writing um, content as a medical writer, I wanted it, uh, as a science writer, I wanted it to be seen but I wanted to be seen by certain people in the world. So when I was writing for the web, I had a, uh, I wanted to be on that top page of Google. I needed to be that first entry. I wanted people to search me and find, find my content straight away. And I want that the same for medical writing. And so these, a lot of skills are definitely transferable from one to the other. But most importantly, which I think Caroline also touched on, are these soft skills or these transferable skills or key attributes that we have embedded in us um, that we can move from one job to another. That's right. No, um, yeah, yeah, that is fantastic. I love that summary. So thank you for for that. Uh, yeah, and I know obviously in your in your skills in your profile you do mention you know really essential soft skills like attentive listening. You know, being able to ascertain a need like what the audience um, needs, um, the, where they currently are, and where they need to get to in terms of that learning journey. Uh, so you have mentioned some key skills. What other key skills do you think are essential for, you know, aspiring writers in the room today to, to be thinking about and to be working on cultivating? Absolutely. Um, you know, for me, some of the, the key skills, obviously you've got the writing. I'm not going to talk about the writing. But for me, a lot of the key skills that uh, are important for, for medical writers or aspiring medical writers is to be adaptable, um, to be organised and be able to multitask, you know. Sometimes your day can be rather face, uh, fast paced and having the skill to switch between different aspects of the same project, different projects altogether, different therapy areas, uh, talking to different people, having multiple calls, changing priorities, all of these things can happen on a day to day basis. And so having the ability to to calmly adapt from project to project is, is super important. And obviously underlining that is to be organized and to be able to multitask like you alluded to. Um, you know, you have to be a good communicator and to be a good communicator, the reciprocal is also important. You need to be an active listener. And so this all underlines being a team player, you know, um, multidisciplinary teams make up medcoms, you know, you can't, you may be the writer, but there's going to be someone who is going to be reading your writing. There's going to be someone who's going to be adding, say, a graphic to it. There's going to be someone who's going to um, do some coding for you if it's a website. So there's many different players um, that make up your team and so you have to be able to listen to them and also be able to communicate your ideas clearly. And obviously you need to listen to the client and you need to be able to clearly tell them what you're able to do, um, but also be able to help them out when they have a problem. And that leads me to my third point, which I really think is you have to be a creative problem solver. Daily, you're gonna be throwing a problem here, fix this, do this. And you have to think about it in a creative way, you know, and um, that underlines basically being a medical writer. And importantly, you have to be able to um, manage conflict resolution. And I don't mean people arguing with each other, but I mean people having different, different opinions and being able to kind of manage that and say, okay, well, 
you say A, you say B, how about we do C, which is a lovely combination of both. Um, and it's all about trying to, you know, work together as a team and be um, able to communicate uh, the, the end product to your target audience in the most effective way. Yeah, that was fantastic and a really, really great summary there of, of just the kind of the breadth of work and what a day to day is like for a medcoms professional. You know, in, in a typical working day, you may only be work, um, actually doing solid writing for a small chunk of that. The rest of that time would be all those things that Emma touched upon. So attending meetings, um, so, you know, working for a problem, maybe planning out the writing before you get cracking uh, and uh, absolutely have a think about, um, you know, your career up until now and you know, how how you've worked and how you've, you know, worked in teams and individually and really think about um, the, um, the those those core attributes and skills that you can transfer over from where you are currently and to um, and to really stand you in good stead when you start your Medcoms career. So thank you so, so much for um, for that story, Emma. That's been fantastic. Um, last but not least, I'll move on now to our last um, panelist, Hannah. Hi, thanks, Laura. Hello, everyone. So I am very new to medical writing. I started maybe up to tell my mom's name what I did in the previous life. So I love a good scientific story and I love medicine and animals. So my background is in veterinary medicine. I also really enjoy making things as visual as possible. So making things as understandable as possible for any audience. And that will include often making things very visual. We've all been there and seen sort of slide decks where there's uh, just a load of text that overwhelms us. So I quite like transforming that into something a lot more understandable and simple. So this is my my past where I am today. So it all actually started, I've, I've put my degree on there first, but it actually probably really started somewhere on a dairy farm in France where I grew up and I always had a love of biology, but I realised, I think probably when we left the farm that I wanted to be a vet. So I struggled my way, way into veterinary medicine, studied at the Royal Veterinary College in London and then went into small animal practice. So I worked for 12 years as a small animal vet in first opinion practice and emergency medicine. Somewhere in the, in the mix now, I moved to Norway because I met my Norwegian husband at university. So I decided to move over to Norway with him and then try my hand at doing veterinary medicine in Norwegian, which was another interesting challenge. And then, I was I was happy in clinical practice, enjoyed it, but a PhD came up that just seemed too interesting to turn down. So I spent four years looking at snake bites in dogs. So it's a clinical PhD, so I looked at the effects of snake bites in dogs. And I think at this point, I was always planning on going back to veterinary practice, but I just really enjoyed the writing side. So I got to writing the thesis, where I think a lot of people are quite sort of maybe a bit burnt out by that point and ready to finish the PhD, but I, I really enjoyed writing it. I was actually ready for, for more after. So I think I realised at that point that there wasn't really any turning back from, from writing. Um, I did a lecture for a while in veterinary anatomy, which I really enjoyed as well. And that also formed part of that. I really enjoyed making slide decks and making things as interactive and accessible as possible for the students. So that just fueled that even more. And then I, I heard about medical writing through another vet, but struggled to get in. So it took me a while of uh, applying for different jobs before I found a way in. I think what's quite interesting is everyone today has had different, very different stories, um, but it can, as I say, it can be very challenging getting into that, getting that first entry level position. So I luckily stumbled across uh, the Monster Academy course last autumn and took part in that, which really helped me not only understand a bit more, because I was going to be potentially making a very big career change, understand exactly what the job entailed, be absolutely certain that's what I wanted to be doing. And um, yeah, applied for jobs after that. And here I am. So it, it worked out in the end, but it took a while to took a while to get there. Yeah, thank you so much for that story. I think that is fascinating. And I think people um, 
it's a it may not be um what people would people might think it, it, they're they're not there is and uh, you know <laughs> yeah the transition from veterinary med medicines can seem like a, a wild um, shift but um yeah and, and there actually may be people in the room today who are you know currently making a similar kind of transition maybe from the clinical setting or otherwise um, to an entirely different industry or sector so obviously you mentioned that medical writing fundamentals course um that we ran was something that gave you a um like a, a flavor for you know medical writing but what what um how did you know how did you kind of make sure that medcoms was the right career for you yeah, I think what I one thing I did do was try and connect with people with a similar background. So other vets who'd gone into medical writing, talk to them directly about how they found the job, exactly what they were doing, what the challenges were in making uh, that career change. But I think really, and I had, you know, I thought medical writing, medicine writing, that's right up my street. But if I'm honest, before I did the course, I don't think I had a good enough understanding of exactly what what the job would involve. So what was great about the course was going through all the different aspects, medical writing, practicing, doing different tasks and practicing some briefs and really getting a, an in-depth idea of what, what I'd actually be doing as a medical writer. Yeah, no, thank you. I think that's some really great um, advice there just to, you know, um, you know, ask, ask questions as well. and and. Uh, and we do also um word monster have a medical writing community um page on linkedin and um, as part of the monster academy so if you aren't already a member of that jenna just popped the link in the chat so you can consider joining that and so there you can do things like participate in polls and read articles you know and ask questions you know and figure out if this is um you know for you because obviously consider making that shift you know and um you want to learn as much about it as possible make sure that is the right step for you uh so just come back to you one more time ask you one more question hannah and what i think i'll do then is pass over to caroline as i'm just conscious of the time um but what general advice do you think you give to anybody looking to enter the world of medcoms don't give up don't get disheartened because it is it is tough to get that first entry level job and um, I think with a bit of, sort of persistence and maybe some lateral thinking to find some uh, yeah, grab opportunities. I saw a course and grabbed an opportunity not only to learn more, but to make more connections, try and not just, I think I, at that point I was thinking, well, telling people isn't working, I'm not getting anywhere. So I'll try and show them instead. And that is how I worked my way in <laughs> into the uh, into an entry level job in the end. So I think the key thing is don't get disheartened. You're going to get a lot of rejections before you finally finally find the job for you absolutely uh no that is some brilliant advice so thank you so much to hannah and to our other panelists rebecca megan and emma i'm now going to stop sharing and i'll pass over to caroline who's going to talk a little bit about uh uh the you know how how we can a bit more information about how we can come um break into medcoms Gonna dive in very briefly just to say sorry we're a little bit uh, behind time um chats as as often um can sort of go go a little bit longer but um yeah do do hang tight we're now coming on to the sort of main main part of the talk so uh yeah enjoy thank you carl and thank you laura such inspirational stories there um, about how everybody has had their own path into medical writing and i'm sure they're going to be really really great and inspirational to everyone in the audience today just thank you for that so yeah as carl said we are leading on to the the last section of of the um talks now we're just breaking into the industry which i think is yeah what you're all really dying to know so firstly, we need you. The industry needs you. There is expected to be a massive surge in the demand for medical writers over the next decade, with the medical writing industry set to more than double from 4 billion to 9.4 billion by 2023. 
Um, what is causing this increase? Um, well, I think as somebody mentioned earlier about the, the digital revolution, which has hit pharma, um, that's one thing we've got increasing need for content, mobile apps, web platforms, e-learning courses, and all of this is, is set to increase across all areas of medical writing from regulatory to clinical and scientific publications. There were many factors affecting this. There is an increasing need for regulatory writing um, with demand for trials to become more complex, growing for more writers. There's a greater emphasis on pharmacovigilance, which is the practice of monitoring the effects of um, medical drugs after they've been licensed for use to identify any unreported um, side effects. And there's a great emphasis on this and a great emphasis on patient safety in particular. Um, there is a greater um, a, a greater trend to outsource medical writing services to specialist com companies like Word Monster. So pharma are outsourcing more and more medical writing, and there's a growing focus on evidence-based medical and clinical research as well. So that's all driving this demand for medical writers. And this coupled with a lack of skilled medical writers. So we know there is an industry-wide um, skills gap for really great skilled medical writers. And this void could soon turn into an abyss if it is not filled. So please know that you're in the right place. And yeah, absolutely, there is a spot for you in this career. As we've all alluded to this morning, breaking into this, this career and uh, it is not easy. There are many problems. There is a lack of brilliant um, writers in the in the industry, as we've seen on the last slide. But there are also very few entry level roles for the number of applicants. Everyone is after somebody with a bit more experience. So how do you get your 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 first step into the door? Training in rare entry level roles may throw you into the deep end where you have to sink or swim. You may get into a new job and if there isn't that training in place, you may suddenly be given your first brief from a client. How do you know how to interpret that brief? Um, what kind of format to present your work in to make sure you're reaching those client expectations? And it really can be a moment of sink or swim if you don't know exactly, if you haven't had the, the, the training in place perhaps. And many talented writers are too far from potential companies and offices and can't relocate. And this is something definitely um, in my heart that break into the industry. I wanted to move away from the large city I, I was living in, but there are very limited, uh, at the time, there are very limited, limited positions that were remote. But we have solutions for these, which I'm sure you're very glad to hear. We are increasing awareness um, of the industry and proactively seeking, seeking out talented individuals. We are working with agencies and pharma to support and, de and develop their entry level positions. We are upskilling junior writers to give them that world class training and mentoring for the best opportunities to succeed. And we are offering full and part time remote training courses uh, for more opportunities to break into the industry. So I'm sure some of these will now kind of, you'll be familiar with these problems having heard some of these talks now. And um, yeah, there are lots of opportunities now available and we're really working at WordMonster to try and help, um, yeah, um, fix this um, lack of medical writers and also the um, lack of, of training. So what is your next step? So if you're sitting there listening to, to these talks, and you're like, this is definitely the place for me. This is what I want to do. And, and you're really passionate about this. What can you do next to break into the industry and land your first role? I'm going to run through a few tips here. The first is to do your research. So companies are looking for science graduates. There, so take time to understand the industry and research the different areas and find the different companies and different areas of writing that most um, stands out for you that you feel you'll, feel you'll be a really good fit for. Think about what working structure and balance is best for you. Do you want to work remote? Do you want to work hybrid? Look for those kind of opportunities and then create a hit list of agencies or companies that you want to reach out for. 
we've heard from some of the medical writers here, Word Monster, the Megan found Word Monster through TikTok. And we've heard from Rebecca about how networking was key for her in her in landing her first role as a medical writer. And so networking really, really is key. And many jobs are found through social media platforms. So it's so important to be present. So please do connect. Please feel free to connect with all of us after the, the session's over. And yeah, really, really use social media. Um, Twitter, LinkedIn um, are both really great places to start. So as um, Rebecca was saying, really vamp up your LinkedIn profile, connect, um, watch and observe all, all the different uh, medical writers out and then the different companies. Follow companies specifically. So any specific companies you're interesting, interested in, yeah, follow them, find out what, what they do, how they work, and if it's the place where you'd really like to be. Of course, get in contact with recruitment agencies. EMWA is the European Medical Writing Association, a really great place to start. And they have loads of information and um, on their website and loads of um, documents they've written that you, that you can read about breaking into the industry. And of course, follow the Medcoms um, Networking, which would be Peter Llewellyn leads. So yeah, be proactive. Um, the olden days would say pick up the phone, but these days it's make a connection. So yeah, really, really seek out people and follow people and make those connections. Secondly, um, is prep yourself, get ready for, for the next stage. So prep your CV, prep your covering letter, prepare yourself for those writing tests, which we were discussing earlier and make sure you're ready. So when that job comes up, you're ready to jump in. A few tips for, you, for your CV, follow a good structure. Um, think visual, so first impressions really do count. Use really specific cats examples, don't just say you have skills in medical writing, give really specific examples so that your future em employer can see exactly what your skills are and what your experience is. Make it purposeful to the job that you are applying for. Pull out all of those skills, whether they're transferable skills from previous jobs, like Emma was talking about in her um, past experience. Pull all those out and really make your CV stand out from the crowd. Things to include on your CV, key achievements. So some of your key achievements and skills that that are suitable for and, and applicable for the job that you are applying from. As I say, really make yourself stand out. What is your um, unique selling point? Bullet point your list of education, your professional qualifications in reverse order. Work experience is, is really important. Um, if you have any yeah, relevant work experience, absolutely pop it down there. But all those transferable skills as well are also super, super important. Pop down all your skills and achievements, computer programs, foreign languages. If you've got experience in any particular programs that are relevant um, to medical writings, such as approval systems as well. And also don't forget to put down any interests. Yeah, you, we all are human beings. It's great to know that we, we have um, that great work-life balance as well. And don't forget to include a covering letter. Covering letters are, are also really important. So really spend time doing your covering letter. And as I say, make it really purposeful to the position that you are applying for. And finally, um, get yourself on a training course. So how can you stand out from the crowd? So I noticed one question in the chat was from Nadine. Nadine, you asked, how do you demonstrate to employers that you have the experience and skills to break into the medical writing from academia and your CV, your writing test, this is where you demonstrate those skills. But if you feel you haven't quite got that got that edge yet, then absolutely look for you look for yourself for a training course. And there are so many different options out there, so many different training courses you can you can look for. There are some graduate training schemes available as well, as well as some short courses. So again, look for something that fits for you, that's going to fit in with your life, and that's going to really um, manage your needs and make sure that you are then going to stand out and really get that first role that you are looking for. I'm just going to go through a few slides about the Monster Academy, which is clearly um, our passion here at Word Monster. 
So the Monster Academy, we, we launched um, last year and it is our mods level training for medical writers. And as Carl said, we're going that step further now and we have our mission. And with an industry-wide lack of medical resource and a strong and ever-growing demand, our mission is to now fill the medical writing void. And we're aiming to train 5,000 medical writers over the next five years. So come in and get on with the action. So you're absolutely you are in the right place if this is something that is going to be of interest to you. What kind of training to, do we provide? We actually provide training right across the board. So at Word Monster, our mission is to transform healthcare communication worldwide. And this is a little part of how we're doing that. We are working with individuals to build careers. So if you're here now, you're a graduate or you're looking for a career change, we're here to support you. Not only that, we work with agencies and we work with pharma as well. So we work with agencies to, to help build teams and to help support them with their training, with their talent acquisition. And we also work with pharma, again, help with the consultancy services to really help build their red, medical writing teams as well. So we really are working across the board, the broad spectrum of the industry to really support in filling this gap of the lack of medical writers. So to just quickly uh, mention the different services that we offer, as I said, we offer consultancy services to um, pharma and to agencies where we can really help build knowledge and services from team mapping or competency building to creating top notch style guides. Not only are we helping train new medical writers, but we're really getting involved in finding new medical writers as well. So talent acquisition is something we're getting involved in and we're doing the hard work for agencies. We have the platforms we can hire, um, attract, filter and hire medical writers. And then the actual training we offer, we offer training workshops and programmes and these have been created especially for healthcare teams. We cover the whole range of medical writing from promotional copywriting to quality control and data checking. We have it all covered, which I'll go into in just a couple of slides time. And not only that, we offer the next level training up as well. So we offer monster mentoring. So once you're a medical writer, if you're an agency or farmer or an individual and you want that next level of support, we offer mentoring programs as well. Again, with, with a curricula in place, um, we offer mainly 10 week programs of mentoring with really focused areas of training and coaching to support writers to become their weapons of words. So we've spent a monumental amount of time developing these courses and I'm sure you've all heard the phrase it takes a village to, to raise a child while well, it took a whole team of medical writers to create this course. Um, you can see pictures of just a few of the people on there who, who have helped develop this course. Everybody who's spoken today has had a, a role in the course um, development as well. And if you think back to Carl's slide right at the beginning of the talk when he was sharing about the expertise we have here at Word Monster, and I'm sure you'll remember Carl saying we have over 100 years of collective experience in medcoms, and all of that knowledge has gone into developing this course. So let me just quickly um, run through the Medical Writing Fundamentals course. This is the course which we have developed for those individuals new to medical writing. And it really provides that basis that you need to start your career. As Megan said in, in her um, talk earlier that she found this really valuable. It covers the vast um, wide variety of different medical writing and therapy areas as well and addresses those misconceptions that people often come to the industry with. The course has five different elements which are all built together in, into this course. We have our core modules. Um, the, we have the, the webinars, which are run once a week. They're three hour webinars. They are interactive. We have breakout groups. We have slidos, which we've been doing here as well. We also have pre-recorded lectures. So you can listen to these lectures in your own time, in the evenings and weekends, whenever it fits in with your life. These are really important. They cover things like compliance and guidelines that we have to adhere to as medical writers, as well as basics in statistics and introdu introduction to clinical trials and the pharmaceutical industry. 
We have home learning. So every week we set a task. These tasks are inspired by real briefs we've had from clients. So it really gives you the opportunity to get experience and develop skills across a wide range of therapy areas and different styles of writing from promotional to medical education to writing for patients. There's additional support, so we can offer tutorials, we can offer networking, we create closed groups on LinkedIn for everybody on, on each intake, which I think people have found really valuable before to really develop that strong support network of people in the same position trying to um, get into medical writing and learning their first steps. And finally, assessment is really key, so at the end of each learning um, learning task, we can provide you with written um, assessment written review of, of how you have done. Um, I think it was Rebecca who was talking earlier about her writing tests and how she submitted some writing tests that she'd worked on for a long time and then didn't get any feedback. So didn't know how to improve. And that's why assessment is so key. We have peer assessment, group assessment, um, self-assessment and also assessment from, from us. So we can really help you see how to improve your writing as well. So this, this course is based over eight modules and the modules cover firstly the different kind of areas of medical writing. So we start with an introduction to medical writing, really looking at what we focus on when we when we do a complete medical writing task, looking at the audience, the tone, the format. We then look at each um, area of medical writing in detail, starting with medcoms and medical education, moving on to medical advertising in healthcare copywriting, writing for patients and the public, writing for publications. And then we look at more agency skills because we need those agency skills as well. So we look at interpreting briefs. So when you get a brief from your client, how do you, how do you know you've got all the information you need? Make sure that you're reaching their expectations and really helping you manage that process. Storytelling and English skills is really vital as a medical writer. So we have a whole module just looking at English skills and how to create that really compelling story throughout each writing task that you complete. And then we've heard a lot about how regulated this industry is. And so data checking, editing, approval systems, quality control is really, really key and vital in this industry. So the last module is all about those final steps in the writing process of making sure your work is spot on before you send it back to a client. So we've, we've um, really enjoyed delivering this training so far there have been so many people involved so many people deliver, delivering modules and yeah we've had so much fun and we've had such positive feedback as well it's been a wonderful process and yeah if you have a look on our website after you can see some of the testimonials there we've got 10 out of 10 across the board so far on all of the courses that we have delivered and we've also now got cpd accreditation for this course as well which may be of interest to some of you out there so we're nearly there. I know you are um, really want to ask some questions and, and get talking. So just I'll finish with um, if you want to know more. I won't go, go on any, any more. I'll let you find out more information for yourself. So yeah, I have some QR codes I will leave on the screen here for you for a moment. So please head over to our Monster Academy website for more details about the dates of our next courses. Please connect with our medical writing community group on LinkedIn where we have chats, we share tips and also just a great place to start that networking. Please check out our Word Monster website for our blogs, our insights and our career openings and follow us on social media to be the first to hear all about our Monster news. And finally, a little shout out that next week we have an in-person event we are attending at the University of Birmingham, um, a Medcoms career event hosted by First um, Medcoms Jobs. So yeah, if you're local to the Midlands or, or even further afield and feel like traveling for a day out, please come and meet us in person there as well. So thank you very much. On that note, I'm going to hand back to Carl and we are going to move into our live panel Q&A. Brilliant stuff. Thank you so much, Caroline and panellists, for really interesting discussions. Um, we've had uh, yeah, a number of, of, of questions come in, um, which Laura is going to now put to uh, the panel. If you have any other questions that you haven't yet asked, um, please feel free to pop them into the, to the chat. If you're watching on YouTube, 
um, you can you can put questions in the comments there. And if anyone would like to um, give it a go coming up to the podium and actually coming up in front of everybody and asking the question live, you're very welcome to. And um, we, we, we can give that a go if we've got any any brave souls amongst us. If you'd like to do that, if you could go up and stand on the question mark uh, little tile and yeah, Cal can just double check uh, the question that you're going to ask. And then once you've got the thumbs up, you can just walk across and step on the megaphone tile. And when you're on that tile, you'll then be able to ask the question and be involved in that particular discussion if you'd like to be. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll now hand over to Laura. Great. Thank you, Carl. And thank you, Caroline. It's always great to hear about the Monster Academy course. And I know that a lot of um, blood, sweat and tears has gone into creating that. Uh, so, yeah, we've had some wonderful questions. We may not get a chance to get to all of them today, but just a reminder to reach out to us on all the channels that Caroline has mentioned, whether that's through our um, work, um, medical writing group on LinkedIn or, or um or via email, any of those channels. Um, so we, if we don't get to your question, then we'll do our best to answer it for you there. Uh, so I'm just going to move on to so for our first question. I'm actually going to ping this one to Carl. So we had a question from Lizelle, which is, are you aiming to branch Word Monster into Medcoms in South Africa in the near future? Nice one. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, we do support clients all around the world, and we actually have um, a team outside of the UK, as I think I might have mentioned in the in the in the initial slides. We have we have two members of the team from Europe, Hannah from Norway, somebody from Portugal. Um, we, we have a small team in the US, and we have a small team in Australia as well. We have two people over there. Um, we don't yet have yet, yet have the sort of um, ability to hire in South Africa, um, but it's certainly something that, that that we're looking to in the future i think we're at, we're in the best time i think as much as covid has been you know horrific for so many so many reasons i think in terms of what it's done for changing the landscape with people being more remote and more sort of virtual jobs available i, th I think it's i think it's been really really great and lots more companies out there are now open to hiring people abroad there are costs associated with that um that there are platforms there are, they're called employers of record essentially who can hire people in, in local countries but they are still expensive they used to be really expensive i'm talking like a thousand pounds a month just for, just to sort the payroll out in that country they're coming down um and i think the more um, sort of companies out there that are doing this the more competitive it'll be and then I don't think it'll be too long until it's, it's, it's seamless and it's cost effective to hire anybody anywhere. That would be fantastic. Thank you, Carl. And yeah, that would be amazing. Open up medcoms to more people from diverse locations. Uh, there'd be a lot of benefits there. Uh, the um, another th um, So another important question from Sonia is, um, do you have to have a PhD to get into medcoms? And I'm happy to sort of um, jump in with this one, but if anyone has anything to add um, from the panel, do do um, do flag. Uh, but I would say absolutely not. I think that maybe when I started about 10 years ago, uh, a lot of agencies were asking for a, a postgraduate degree, like a PhD or a master's. But um, equally, um, the agency that I got my first job with, they didn't require this. And you find in more and more, there is definitely a shift. and. You know, uh, a lot of agencies, um, they'll ask that you have a life sciences degree. A PhD may be preferable. And the reason for that is because, of course, you do pick up a lot of those soft skills during your PhD. You know, you're designing, running experiments. You are communicating with a team. You are you have tenacity because after, you know, dozens of failed Western blots, you know, you, you have to somehow keep going. And all those are really valuable skills. But if you um, are coming from a different career path and you can demonstrate that you you have those soft skills um, within the path that you've come from, then absolutely you can make any of yourself medcoms. And I should mention that if you are um, able to stick around at the end, we do have our editorial director, Dave, um, who'll be sitting on um, bench nine. And he he um, himself doesn't have a PhD, but has obviously become, you know, thrived in the industry and found a place for himself. So absolutely short answer there is yes, you absolutely can. No, sorry, obviously you don't have to have a PhD. Pardon me there. So I will, um, for the next question, and this is a really interesting one, again, from Lizelle, is about the role that medical writers play in the creative aspect of, you know, designing slide decks and promotional materials. Um, do we just write the content or do we, um, are we able to dabble a bit in the design ourselves? And I might pass this one over to Megan, actually. Um, what, um, how have, 
how do you implement design into your medical writing? That's a really good question because it's something I didn't really consider until I started in Medcoms and it's actually a part of Medcoms that I love. I think it's dependent on the client. Some may just want you to contribute to the copy. Sometimes they might want to use to leave comments for the design team in the copy of suggestions. So we could add a button here or we could have this text in bold. I really like briefs that come in, usually the slide decks where you have full creative control. You can do whatever you think looks best and kind of put that to the client. They may change it. Sometimes the design team really loves it and we'll just kind of neaten it up a little bit. Um, but yeah, it's, if you're interested in design, it is definitely a side of Medcoms I didn't really consider. And it's probably the part I enjoy the most at the moment. Yes, thank you, Megan. And yeah, that's a really great answer. Uh, so another question here um, from Ipsita is, how does one find their niche area for writing? Because as we heard from Caroline, there is a wide spectrum of types of writing you can go into. Um, I might pass this one on to Emma. Um, have you got any kind of tips for that? Yeah, sure. It's a great question because it's, you know, it's something that I feel, but it cannot replace all of the things that we can do as writers because it, you know, simply it lacks that human, human connection. And that's what we need in our writing. We need that humanness because it's all about integrity and transparency because we're talking about quality and making sure we have the best quality research and the best quality communication. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I fully, I fully concur that it, it certainly can't replace, but can it reduce the, 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 the need for so many writers, given that it might be able to do simplistic tasks like data checking, QCing, things that maybe when you're starting out in your career, you know, the industry has heavily relied on associates for, do you think in terms of total numbers going forward, the industry will change in that respect? It's a difficult one to answer, isn't it? I think that AI is going to transform lots of industries. Um, I still think, for me, that I'm not I'm not too worried. I think that there are it'll give us more time to do the things, the creative things that we should be doing. And another sort of take is that, in a way, it makes our our, our sort of work as medical writers and content creators even more important because there's going to be more content out there that's even more generic and being able to for a client you know being able to stand out and put your hand up a sort of above the crowd when you're thinking about creative you know materials i, I would say it's even more important our roles in sort of helping people stand out that there's going to become no doubt you know more more content out there and absolutely i think it is going to change it's going to be really interesting to see but i think we're just going to be more more productive i don't think in immediately it's going to have that that big of an impact in our industry and as you you may sort of have heard as well vicky you know yourself pharma always seemed to be 10 years behind that's always been the sort of term i had in, in my head whether or not that that's true here with ai i have seen one farmer actually one pharma company just last week where they've actually implemented um something called my chat gpt it's their own version of chat gpt into their kind of um company across the board to help them speed up certain tasks so yeah i think we're all the world's watching isn't it oh, absolutely uh, Merck, is it i saw that one yes that's right it was Merck. yes i used to work for novartis and we were using rudimentary ai uh, last year when i was still there um to do basic tasks like qcing and writing regulatory documents and things and basic publications um but we'll have to see where it goes yeah <laughs> Okay, thanks for your opinion on that. Thank you, Vicky, for that question. Uh, yes, and um, does anyone else want to step to the podium? If not, then I will. Um, we do have some more questions here that have been coming through. Uh, so, uh, give me a moment. So, we'll just see what we've already answered. Um, so, give me a moment. Uh, Pardon me, it's just the question. So, what's this? The light comes on stupid. So, um, yeah, this is an interesting one actually for people who are looking ahead. So, what is the path after principal medical writer? And um, I'm happy to kind of take this, but Carl obviously jump in um, if you want to add to it. But at the moment, that is um, um, that's a really good question because I think that 
maybe traditionally there's been the expectation that somebody who is at a principal medical writer role may take on maybe an associate editorial director or become an editorial director or head up you know the head of you know their scientific services department uh but uh, i think that we're getting more and more flexible i think in our approach to progression i think that progression is not linear for what you know it can look different from any two people as you've probably heard from our stories from the panelists today you know a, a few um a few of us, for instance, have gone on to head up a service or, you know, occupy a particular niche. So you can absolutely make of your uh, your career um, what you want. There is a defined career path, per se, because you start as an associate then a medical writer, senior and such forth. But what you do with that and how you take that role, I think, has become a lot more flexible in recent years. Uh, so thank you for that question. Uh, we have somebody here. Um, Adam, did you have a question you wanted to ask? The Hi, can everyone hear me okay? Yes, we can, yes. So, um, just my background is I've, uh, I'm a PhD with seven years uh, postdoc experience, um, looking to get into a, in a different industry. And my, um, I'm just wondering if I'm, if it's just me and my imp impression is incorrect, but the impression I've had from my job search the last couple of months is that um, there seems to be limited, despite the, the the need for more medical writers. There seems to be limited entry level roles. Um, it seems to be on, on LinkedIn, I can find pages and pages and pages of roles for people with between one and three years experience with competitive salaries. And I just get the feeling that companies are more, um, they'll, they'll more readily poach each other's staff rather than, uh, you know, take it, taking people without experience and, and train up people with, with potential. So I'm just wondering if that's, if that's, you know, is that an incorrect impression? Is that something that's going to change? Because I've only found a couple of companies that seem to have this kind of dedicated training program where they take somebody without medical writing experience that may have, uh, you know, experience with writing their own publications and this kind of stuff. That's and a great taking question. Them, taking them through a full training program up to the point where they become a, you know, an associate or a junior medical writer. It's a great question, Adam, and you're actually totally on point. And it's really strange because it's, it's always been that way. Um, there are a few entry level roles. And th there are a few reasons that I think we've, we have touched on a few today. Um, a lack of training, a lack of sort of e every every agency is focused on delivering work. And you're totally right. Everyone's sort of trying to sort of pinch each other's writers. But this is why we, we want to sort of stop this. We want to sort of break this cycle. And we're actually we're actively now working with a couple of really large agencies to help them build um, and give them the tools and resources to be able to then find and hire and the confidence really to to commit time to bringing people in and training them up um, and some companies are you know hiring people in in droves you know i'm talking 50 80 people per year um, a lot of people are getting their act together more more sort of internal courses are being developed but we've, we've certainly seen this with with a few of the larger companies but really it is Initially, it's only been the larger companies with the resources who can dedicate to these things. Um, but that's what we're, we're trying to do. We're trying to work with these companies, give them more confidence, and hopefully that is going to start to start to change things across the industry. Great. Um, yeah, thank you. I think we're definitely on a mission to, to fill that skills gap and, and get people on the um, um, on the career ladder. Uh, so. Um, just skimming through some of the other questions. So um, before getting to entry level, does taking courses related to medical writing help? And I think I could speak for our group to say, yes, I, I believe it absolutely does. I think that, um, uh, you know, it's great being great to see more and more agencies and actually external um, external people of offering these courses. I know that um, if you connect on LinkedIn, you can find individuals who do run courses as well. And any learning that you can have that can kind of um, help you get an appreciation of the um, of the work involved and have a go at writing yourself, figuring out what your niche is uh, and, you know, uh, learning more about medical writing is absolutely going to help you. So yes to that question, Danielle. Um, so this is an interesting one for Elsa. So maybe I'll like pass this one on to Caroline, actually. So how is MedComs different from medical writing or is it the same thing? 
So that yeah, that, that's a great question. And there's a broad spectrum of medical writing which covers so many diff different areas. And um, medcoms is quite specific. As as we said um, earlier on, medcoms agencies like us, we we support pharma in, in many of their communications. Um, there are other areas of medical writing that the different uh, medcoms agencies don't specialize in, and some don't. So for example, um, we we don't do too much regulatory writing here at WordMonster, but there are other companies sim similar set up to us who do specialize in, in um, regulatory writing. Um, so Medcoms is more specifically for the, the communications that, that, that we support for, for pharma, um, but it does cover a lot of the umbrella of different kind of types of medical writing that we specialize in. So I, I guess my advice to you if you're kind of branching out kind of looking to break into the industry and not quite sure where to go i'd say again networking look on linkedin follow different companies see what different companies do to really get a feel for the different areas of medical writing so you can really feel where you think you can slot in um i think that would be a, a, a really great start excellent thank you so much everybody um so it's it's four, four past twelve um we're going to cut the live stream here but everybody in 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 the space with us um, are now welcome to um, to stay on if you'd like to feel free to leave if you if you've got somewhere to be but um, we're going to now move down to the benches below us so if you navigate your way down there um, if I could ask everyone on 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 the well before I do I'm just gonna just gonna say my thanks actually yeah just thank you for everybody for coming and um, thank you to all of all of the speakers this has been really really interesting conversations I hope everyone's sort of found something that's relevant for them and um, yeah if you have any other questions any specific things that we haven't covered come and grab us now see see you on the bench <laughs>